Hello everyone, uh, thank for being here. And first I would like to thank GC, GC Europe and GC Iberia for this opportunity for uh, let us to share what we are doing now in our daily practice in minimum intervention dentistry. And overall I would like to thank them also for letting us to be part of a European Board of Minimum Intervention Dentistry. This working group is, uh, is made up of researchers, university professors and clinicians from different countries with different specialities uh, with the common goal of uh, the better stability in the oral health of our patient. We like to think that we are treating them from a more holistic point of view. Now we are working on uh, a clinical protocol to implement this philosophy, this minimum intervention dentistry in, in the clinic, in the private clinic or in our daily practice. Uh, always trying to be based on scientific evidence. Uh, using this MI treatment plant as a basis and also uh, based in the ICDAS modify, meaning International Carriers Detection and Assessment System, and also trying to assess the individual carrier risk of the patient. We try to implement this minimum intervention philosophy in, in our practice. We have to be really prepared on new technologies and we, we have to think deeper and understand the traditional te techniques because we have to motivate the patient and we have to improve the, the compliance in the patients. Minimum intervention and minimum invasive dentistry are two terms widely used lately, but many times we don't make a difference between them. So whenever someone wants to speak about dentistry and being modern, they try to use both in the same way and there's a slight difference. We have to understand that minimum intervention tries to prevent and detect the disease as soon as possible. We want to know what is happening to try to stop it before it starts. And if we have to treat, what we want is to treat in the way, in the less invasive uh, way possible. So whenever a treatment is needed, what we are going to do is to look for the less invasive possibility because we know that the degree of intervention is uh, directly proportional with the degree of loss of tissue. So what we have to try is to be aware of that, to, to adopt this uh, philosophy from the basis, from, from the point of diagnosis and detection, because there's a lot of literature, most of it uh, free on the web, that talks about the benefits of implementing the MI philosophy in the clinic. So we have to have a proactive attitude as, as clinician and of course the patients because we have to have them informed, we have to motivate them because what we want is to share the, the, uh, the weight. We want to, them to take charge of their own oral health with our help. So under the umbrella of the MI treatment plan, we are going to uh, go step by step from identification, meaning that we are going to see what is happening, which is the cause of the disease, and then we are going to prevent the establishment of the disease, trying to implement uh, different treatments to stop the, the carious lesion to start, then we are going to restore whatever is already a lesion and after that we have to understand that maintenance is really important. We need the patient to have the things under control, under their own control. Of course with our help but we have to really maintain the patient coming to the clinic because it's the only way for them to have a good oral health to maintain that. So what we do in the, our clinic for us uh, is multidisciplinary minimum intervention dentistry because we don't only work on carriers. We like to see the patient, like we said before, in a more holistic way. 
So what we have to think is, okay, do we have patients like that? Do we have many of them now? I don't think so, but still we have some of them. But as you can see here, this is a more or less easy patient to treat. Of course, there's a lot of cavities, of course, there's a lot of inflammation, but the patient has a lot of plaque under control. So if we start with the motivation and the uh, dental arterial plaque control, it's going to be more or less easy to uh, balance this patient. But the, think about that one. Is that a patient that you see frequently? This is the first visit appointment. This is the first picture. This is the way of control of plaque that this patient has. And even though he has caries in, in the anterior tooth, so maybe this is a more difficult patient to treat because in these cases, we need to understand what is happening because if with this control of plaque, the patient has caries, something else is happening. Something similar to that uh, is happening in this patient. Of course, we have seen a lot of patients like that. Then we have to analyze what is happening. Is just restoring the option or we have to do something else? Because once we restore the patient, if we don't control the factors that are really unbalanced, we are going to have more tissue lost. So restoring, of course, is not enough in patients with this uh, acidic uh, attack on the surface. As Francesca Bailati told us, we have a very nice protocol and simple protocol to restore, but we have to add control of the factor that start with the problem, that really develop this problem. So continue with the uh, with the protocol, with the scheme that we talked before, we are going to be talking about identification. Identification the first appointment. What does it mean? That we are going to, to do as we have been, been doing before, the clinical history of course, the patient general assessment. We are going to add something, not new, but we are going to record the results of that, which is the saliva checks, and then we are going to do detection of the plaque and then we are going to remove this plaque of course because we want to do caries detection with a clean and dry tooth. So we are going to do visual detection, radiograph and if we need it we are going to use complementary methods. And then also we are going to do something that we maybe did before but we didn't uh, get enough deep in the, in the concept, we are going to assess the carries risk of this patient. So in this first appointment, what we are going to analyze is how is the patient, meaning that how is his behavioral uh, attitude, the psychological attitude, how is uh, the way the patient lives, because communication is very important and this first visit is when we are going to get in touch, we are going to be in contact with this patient and is the first impression where we are going to be able to connect and understand what kind of patient we have. So the level of education is going to be important to, to know the understanding of the situation that we are going to explain to them is it's good and then it's going to be important for the compliance. So this first visit has to be somehow a motivational interview. We need to learn how to interview our patients since the first day, being able to motivate them to connect with us because we need them to compliance at the end. They have to maintain their own health, so they really need to be motivated by us about that. Okay, the saliva test, as we said, is something we have been doing, not really recording, but doing before, of course, I know, but we have to remember that when the salivary function is poor, this is the main pathological factor in the caries development. So we, we have to remember that saliva is, is responsible, responsible for the tooth protection if it works well. It's antibacterial. It has a nice buffering capacity always when it's a good saliva. Able to remineralize, able to have a good 
uh, immune response against the acid, not the acid really, about, uh, against the bacteria. So we are going to do really three or four simple tests and maybe the first one is going to be the level of hydrate, hydration. We need to know whether the salivary minor glands are working correctly or not. So we are going to dry the lower lip, we are going to dry it with a wipe, and then we are going to count 60 seconds to see if it's enough, the amount of drop in the surface of this uh, surface. We would, we would need at least 10 or 12 of these bubbles in the surface to understand that in 60 seconds this is going to be enough hydration. If there are less, we will think that it's just a dry level or a low level of hydration. Consistency is, is the, the next uh, test. We always have th thought that if the saliva is sticky, if the saliva is thick, is going to be a not good uh, situation for the patient because the carbohydrates are going to stay longer, is going to be able to be food for the bacteria. So most of the time, the acid level is going to be very, very low. So if the saliva is uh, watery, we will count it as green, meaning good. And if it is sticky or made bubbles, we will think that this is a high risk patient somehow considering the consistency. Another test that we do most of the time, I would say always in every visit also almost, is the pH. The non-stimulated saliva pH is very quick and it gives a lot of information and also help the patient because of the visual uh, color index to understand what is happening in their mouth. They always want to have bad saliva because if they have bad saliva, bad uh, function, they understand that they don't have really the, the they are not the guilty ones about what is happening with, with their mouth. And somehow they are right. If the pH is low, we know that the, the enamel is going to dissolve very easily. So we need to assess which is this pH I would say every time they come, just to check if the method that we are implementing, what we are trying to learn and teach them is, is working. Thinking on this result, we will decide to do the saliva check buffer. Uh, maybe it takes longer, a little bit, but it gives us a lot of information. Saliva check buffer uh, it's, a, it's a kit where we can measure the amount of non-stimulated saliva, the amount of stimulated saliva, then we can measure also the pH of both situations, and we can also check the buffer capacity. If the saliva has a good buffer capacity, it means that the patient will eat, and then the saliva will compensate this acidic situation, but if the saliva doesn't have a good buffer capacity, whenever the patient eats, the acidic situation is going to be longer and the dissolve of the enamel is going to be more, at, I mean, it's going to be a high risk of dissolving, helping the bacteria to, to uh, I wouldn't say break the tooth, but somehow they have to think that because we, we need them to understand that brushing after eating, if they have lower capacity of buffering, it's, impos it's important. The next thing that we do is, as we said before, the plaque detection. We always use this three plaque, IDGL, because it's very simple to apply and then it's, it's because of the colors, it's very uh, uh, easy to understand for the patient. Uh, the, we have three different colors. The pink or red one is meaning that the plaque is fresh. The blue color means that this plaque is more or less older, meaning 48, 72 hours. And then if we have this slightly green, uh, light uh, blue color, this is a very mature plaque able to produce a lot of acid. So the patient will understand what is happening with, 
when they brush their teeth or not and if they have enough ability to do it. So we also uh, have the opportunity to give them a toothbrush and let them to brush their own teeth without instruction. It helps a lot to see what is the attitude and the capacity of the patient to remove the plaque and if we don't have enough time we can use our low speed uh, with a, a prophylaxis brush and we can take it our own. At the end what we need is clean and uh, dry tooth because we want to assess the surface, we want to assess the, the, the uh, changes, sorry, the changes on the surface among, uh, among the color, the texture, uh, the irregularities and if the tooth is dry is the best uh, to really be able to see that. Of course if we have magnification we will be able to see better. Uh, overall uh, if we are uh, after 40, 45 it's, it's great. So you can see here the wet surface, the moist and the dry in the same tooth and of course in the first picture you will see that almost it's impossible to see what is happening. Then in the dry one you see that the premolar has two spots that we have to control because whenever the brightness and the color change slightly we will be able to record that to control that lesions, to take the proper attitude in these lesions. The next that we are going to do is the radiograph of course that we even with all this technological advance, we need to do this Bidwin's radiograph. They, until now, are the best to be able to diagnose interproximal carriers. So we have to do it with a correct uh, angle to be able to see enamel and dentin without superimposing. Uh, now we try to change slightly what we use to describe caries. What that this means? Now we are, we are, we are using the IGDAS modify uh, index because we are not longer talking about black class 1, black class 2 lesions because these are restorative names more than lesions. Now we are going to measure if the lesion is in enamel, the inner half or the outer half, if the lesion is in dentin and this is what we are going to name, we are going to call the lesion because of the extension, not, not because of what we are going to do to restore it. We are not longer to drill a cavity based on the material. We are going to clean as less as possible the tissue to have a good and long-lasting restoration. We have in the website the, the IDAX uh, that ORG where we can find a lot of information even they have uh, free courses that we can do on the web. We have a lot of technology around for diagnose and maybe these four for us are mainly uh, the more useful in our opinion. Laser fluorescence, a dynodent from Cabo is a very good tool for occlusal caries. It has been used for at least 10 or 15 years and I think it's, it's good for us and for the patient because it's not subjective. It, it has a numerical classification of the lesions so we can control what is happening. Something similar happened with Vistaproof from Dur. Uh, it, ha it assesses the level of porphyrin which, which is related with the bacterial activity so we can measure what is happening about uh, around the, the, the area with the bacteria. We also have Diagnocam. Diagnocam is a good method to control uh, based on diphotic technology to control the extension and the progression or, or arrest of the lesions and also we now have a nice software easy to use uh, with regular and standard or digital radiographs called Logicon because now uh, the program is going to be able to analyze the radiograph much more uh, 
selectively that we, because it's possible to have more race uh, differences, meaning that the radio density or the radio lucency is going to be measured uh, in the gray scale for the software, from the software. Here you can see different views from the same uh, clinical picture. Uh, the clinical one, the x-ray, the vista proof image and the diagnocam image. For us, maybe these four will be complementary. It's of course big amount of money to have in the clinic, but at the end we will be able to control and monitor the carrier situation of the patient. Now we have analyzed or identified the first part of the situation of our patient, but with all this data and based on the camera protocol, we would like to individually assign or uh, assess the risk carriers of this patient. Because we have been saying that if the patient has an open cavity, if the patient has uh, interproximal lesion, it's a high risk patient. We all know that. But what is happening really with this patient? What is the factor that is not working properly? Which are the risk factors and the protective to, to be able to balance what is happening? Because we don't want new carriers. We don't want just to feel what is uh, already open or we don't want to drill and feel just that. We want to really diagnose in advance, in the beginning, if the risk factors are wrong, we are going to compensate them and the protective factors are working very good, we are going to improve them as much as possible. So based on this diagram from Featherstone, which was the, the coordinator or the leader of the camera uh, protocol, which uh, ended or was published for the first time around 2004. Uh, based on this, I would say almost every scientific society uh, has a new questionnaire wherever they analyze the risk and, and the protective factors to assess the individual carrier's risk in our patient, in, in this special uh, patient. So we are going to use one of these to be able to, to position or to set where, what is the patient situation. So now that we know which is the risk, that uh, what fa factors are working properly and which factors are not, we are going to try to prevent a new carries to appear. We are going to prevent uh, uh, to have a new uh, development of, the, of a new lesion. So we would like to say that we are going to do early treatment more than prevention because we are going to treat the causes of the disease. And I think my, my, my opinion is that the patient understand uh, with a better point of view, with a better attitude, that we are going to treat the, uh, the, the causes of the disease more than we are going to prevent the disease. Because of course, if it's a risk, high risk patient, is it going to have new lesions in the future if we don't do something about that? So for, to start, we are going to control the bacteria. And the, the main thing is to have a proper tooth brushing meaning that we have to help the patient to do it properly, but we don't have to teach the patient just in a, in a, in a model. We have to customize, we have to analyze how, how the patient that, uh, does the, the technique, how he or she uses the toothbrush, and then we have to help to improve what he or she is doing. So we, we, we will use uh, plaque detectors always there's nothing better to see where the plaque is. And if the plaque detection system is like uh, three plaque, it's great because they will see if the plaque is new or not, and if it's acidic. So we, we, will, we will need that not only in the clinic, we have to recommend the patient to use any kind of system to detect and, and dye the plaque because it's going to be, to be the best for them to, to really remove what is there uh, over the surface. 
So if we use the, the right time, if we uh, analyze what the patient kind of, uh, of, life, of life is, we will help him or she to do the better toothbrushing possible in the right moment of the day. Because not always is, okay, always after eating, always uh, before going to bed. It depends on, on, the, on the way of living that they have. Another thing that we have to consider is that most of the time we rinse after toothbrushing with water, but if we use toothpaste with fluoride and then we rinse with water, we are going to lower the level of fluoride in the mouth. So the, the actual recommendation is to rinse, but not with water. We have to rinse with a proper uh, mouth rinse. In this case, I would say with fluoride. And then, if we need it because of the risk of the patient, we are going to recommend chlorhexidine. So whenever the patient needs it, uh, they will use chlorhexidine at least one week a month, not, not uh, forever, but for a long period of time, because we know that uh, chlorhexidine has a, a strong affinity for the oral structures and is a very uh, good antibacteria. So in lower concentrations, we know that interferes with the cell transportation and also with the metabolic pathways. So it helps to reduce more or less 80% of the uh, plaque in, in the bacterial population in plaque in, in saliva. And then it maintains these levels for several weeks. So we, we based on this camera protocol, choose to uh, suggest the patient to use for brushing and mouth rinse, uh, chlorhexidine one week a month, mainly the first week uh, in low concentration twice a day. Another product that we use to fight against uh, uh, microorganisms are, is xylitol. Xylitol it's, uh, is a kind of sugar from alcohol. It's not able to be metabolize, metabolized by the bacteria, so it's not going to be helping the bacteria uh, to live. It selects the less uh, active, uh, acidic active uh, producing bacteria and also make them less sticky. So it doesn't help the bacteria to stay in the mouth. It's going to be able to load the bacterial load. So we should recommend the patient, not only because of that, but also because it's going to stimulate the saliva flow rate, saliva flow rate, to use xylitol, uh, six to 10 grams every day during at least six months because we don't want to, to tell them as much time as they can really get tired of it. So once we are controlling the plaque, we are controlling the, the plaque from two different uh, point of view with the fluoride and toothbrushing and with the chlorhexidine and xylitol, we want to remineralize what is happening in this tooth. If there's initial lesions, we want them to arrest and if it's possible, we would like to have the tooth as it was before. So Recaldent is, is a molecule obtained from the milk casein. It was discovered in, in Melbourne, the university, and it's a phosphopeptide from casein and it has phosphate and calcium able to adhere to the plaque and then able to get into the tooth structure. So uh, if we are able to oversaturate the, the uh, environment with calcium and phosphate with the right uh, formulation, this is going to go into the tooth to reconstruct again this enamel uh, prints that have lost part of the structure. What we do is to recommend the patient to use it at least six weeks minimum. Uh, they have to apply it uh, over the surface of the tooth. Every tooth that have a wide spot of interproximal lesion, so most of the time they use it all around the mouth and they have to scrub a little bit with the finger. 
is a topical application one or twice a day and after that they don't have to speed or rinse. So if it's only one, we recommend to have this uh, product right uh, next to the bed, meaning in the bed, uh, in the table side bed, because it's the best moment to apply it and then just going to sleep. In what kind of patients are we going to recommend recalent? Always in patients with orthodontics appliance because they have more plaque retention, of course. In every patient with early lesions because we have to remineralize these early lesions. Uh, whenever they, they want to uh, do widening because at the same time reduces the hypersensitivity, so it's going to help to maintain the uh, micro hardness in the enamel structure and also it's going to reduce or, or almost avoid the hypersensitivity because of the whitening. Of course, after periodontal treatment because of the same reason. And of course, in all these patients with erosion because we want to compensate the low pH. So, uh, Recalent is going to balance this pH because of the calcium and the phosphate and it's a good uh, way to maintain after and during the, uh, the process of reconstruction in this uh, erosive patient. Something else to prevent the establishment of the disease to the, the, the development of caries uh, is fissure sealant. Uh, we have been doing it uh, for a long period. Maybe we only think that fissure sealants are for young patients and for uh, just erupted tooth, but it's, it isn't like that. We have to seal every tooth structure able to develop a caries because of the anatomy. It doesn't matter if the patient is 7, is 21 or is older because what we want is to be able to avoid this establishment of bacteria in the deep fissures and we want to have this surface uh, flat enough to be easy to clean. Uh, something that we have to take into consideration is that because we want to maintain as much structure as possible, we want to seal or infiltrate the initial lesions depending on the situation, depending on, on where it is located. So we will try to also apply calcium phosphate and fluoride varnish because we want the whole structure to be strong enough, we want the, the whole tooth to be remineralized as much as possible and in the areas that we are afraid of a not too good control of the plaque or because of the access or the ability of the patient or because of the aesthetic, we would like to infiltrate. So we have a nice product, it's called Icon. It's at the end, it's a resin able to penetrate in the enamel in the deep area of the demineralized enamel. And what it's going to do is just fill the spaces and is going to recover the tooth, the appearance because of the refraction index. Once the resin is there, it's going to be the same as it was before uh, the caries. We are going to edge with hydrochloric acid and then dry with uh, some type of alcohol and then infiltrate with the resin. When is it indicated? Whenever the lesion is non cavitated of course, because we want to fill the smaller spaces and uh, whenever the lesion is not deep in the dentin, so until D1 and always with uh, intact enamel, meaning not cavitated. Uh, the result in the, in the terms of aesthetic is very good, but we are not going to have remineralization in these areas. We are going to seal the structure uh, with resin, so in the rest of the mouth we would like to have this high-risk patient using something else to protect the surface, meaning of course calcium, phosphate and, and fluoride as we said before. As you can see here, two years follow-up, 
it's a nice uh, maintenance of the, of the aesthetic of the tooth and of course this has to be a patient under control, meaning that it has to do uh, a follow-up visit every three or four months maximum. So now we think that we have to be green. It's, it's really uh, fashionable nowadays to be green in, in, every, in every concept and in our field it, it means to save enamel. So this is a clinical case of one of our patients. She has quite good plaque uh, uh, control, but when we did the test, what we saw was that she was uh, eating too much sugar in between meals, meaning that uh, if she didn't have a good buffer capacity, which she didn't have, she was going to be uh, a very high risk patient. As you saw in the radiograph, she had a lot of interproximal lesions. So we identify the, the causes of the disease, then we work with her in motivation, trying to lower the carbohydrate intake. Of course, we try to, to improve as much as possible the plaque control. We help her with chlorhexidine, yes, because we need to lower always as maximum as possible the, the bacterial load. We want to remineralize every initial lesion, so we recommend Recaldent at the beginning six weeks, and after that, we wait for the next appointment to decide if she's going to use it uh, once again or more than one, one time. Uh, we want to re-evaluate the preventive measures and, and decide what are the lesions that we are going to treat and which are going to be just for remineralization and control. So we did some restoration because they were deep enough to restore, but the initial lesions, we wanted to, to treat them after one year of uh, this protocol because she was living abroad. We wanted to seal these spaces where we didn't get an improvement in the, in the radio density. So we decided to seal these interproximal lesions, the initial ones. So we have two methods. We started with these elastomeric separators. We uh, set them in her mouth two days before. As you can see in this picture, we get some space between the uh, 46 and the 45, but we didn't have enough space between the two premolars. So we started with these two and we use uh, wedges in between the premolars, incremental size of wedges to open the space while we were doing the other pairs uh, of tooth. So we edge and then we use the bonding. We adapt, ad, ad, adapt as much as possible a contour strip and then we fill uh, the surface, we, we seal, I would say, the surface with a uh, heavy fill flowable composite. So we need to adapt very well before we polymerize because we want just a very thin layer of composite. We don't go, want to increment the volume of the tooth because we don't have this space. We have opened it just for meaning of the restoration. Then we do the same in the, other, uh, in the, contra, uh, in, in the other side of the tooth, in the mesial of the 30, uh, 45 and the distal of the 44. Here we use the, the wedges, as we said before, until we have enough space. So it's, of course, not a very simple technique. And in this situation, whenever we want to do minimum uh, invasive treatment, we need to use magnification because what we are going to do needs some, uh, some, I would say, ability or uh, protocol and strict technique to be able to do it in, in, in the sense of improving the quality of the patient's uh, life. So we don't want to do this composite in the interproximal area and then have a more uh, uh, areas for retention of plaque. It has to be very, very well adapted. Here you can see the, the, the final picture of the restorations, uh, the ceiling uh, of the proximal areas. Uh, and here is the radiograph. Uh, maybe this is a quite uh, strange image if we don't have 
uh, if we don't give to the patient an inform uh, with the explanation of what we have done, because if another dentist took a radiograph, it's, it's going to be a quite a strange image. This is a follow-up uh, one year later. Uh, there's a lot of publications about the cost and the effectiveness of this kind of treatment. Of course, we, we know, already know, that whenever we do non- or micro-invasive treatment, in the, in the long term, it's going to be better for the patient. In, in the terms of maintenance of the healthy tissue and also in the cost terms. So we, we have to, to fight to implement this, this philosophy in our uh, clinics. So let's see what we do with cavitated lesions. So now we, we think that if you want to be green, authentically green, of course you have to save enamel, but dentin is really important. So let's see what happened with this uh, so frequent pathology that we now have, dental erosion what we should do with this patient to, to, to balance the situation, of course, is to give them fluoride, to stimulate the saliva flow rate. We have to neutralize the acid because there's a big problem with the acid, so we are going to recommend calcium phosphate uh, and, and uh, fluoride in the same product, uh, for example, uh, MI paste. We recommend it twice a day minimum because this patient has a problem most of the time from the stomach, so whenever they eat, if they don't have the time to brush and they don't have the opportunity because some of them eat frequently because of these stomach problems, we recommend them, recommend them to use more than twice a day. So we, of course, reconstruct, but also apply something to balance, to neutralize the acidic. And of course, we cover lesions smaller, uh, like this one, not a big, big destruction. We want to have the dentin seal because it's not as hard as the enamel, so the food and the activity in the mouth, always with acid, is going to destroy and dissolve the dentin faster and we don't want that because we don't want to lose, uh, to lose tooth structure. There we have uh, a very maybe controversial case. We like to think that we try to maintain as much uh, tooth structure as possible, so in this case we did a tunnel restoration. We know that it's not a very well seen option. There are some publications that, that uh, really uh, doesn't recommend to do that, but what we think is that, okay, let's try, let's explain, explain to the patient, and if we have any problem, we will restore the reach. So during this time, we have been doing, as you can see here, for, with uh, more than four years, the follow-up of very, uh, I wouldn't say a lot of our patients, and. The technique works whenever you do the incremental uh, um, feel of composite, meaning that whenever you add composite, you do it in the, in the more safe way for this little structure that we are maintaining. So we have to support the, the bridge. We have to start with composite from uh, the lower part of the bridge, and then we fill the whole proximal box. Another option is to maintain the proximal wall. Not always possible because sometimes we have uh, cavitated uh, enamel, but in this occasion we didn't have that. So we saw uh, clinically and radiographically that the enamel was there and we wanted to stop the dentin caries to advance because this patient, even we try a lot to motivate her she was not very good with compliance, so we didn't want to wait more. What we did was opening a very small uh, access to the dentin. We use uh, a caries detector because it's very difficult to see inside the hole, inside the cavity, and we only eliminate the dentin, the affected dentin, uh, the infected dentin, sorry. So then we 
uh, edge denamel and use a, a self etching um, adhesive in the dentin because we prefer to do selective etching. Uh, we fill the cavity and here is maybe the more complex uh, part of the treatment. We have to be able to seal first the proximal wall because it's very thin, so the first increment of composite is going to be very, very small and is going to be towards the proximal area. So because of the small uh, access, we will have to do some increments, very small ones, and most of the time we are going to need to use uh, a specific instruments, very small one. As you can see here, we started with a spatula, but after that we will have to use a smaller and a smaller instruments because we didn't have space to move inside the cavity. So then you can see here we use a, a probe because we didn't have a space. Of course we can discuss if we can do a, full, a bulk uh, filling here, but in my opinion with this thin wall of enamel and this enamel is, as you can see, a little bit wide, meaning that it's not completely uh, filled of hydroxyapatite. We prefer to do it in increments. So here you can see the final restoration and of course the radiograph of the case with this uh, white spot in the enamel. Okay, let's think a little bit deeper and rethink what we are doing. And what we are doing is managing the deep carriers like long time ago. What does it mean that we are going back again? As you can see here, Tom's long, long time ago said that it's better if we leave this color dentin protecting the pulp instead of sacrificing the pulp in the tooth. So not in that area, meaning 1859, but now, in 2010, 2011, we have a lot of publication on what tissue we should remove. And at the end, this very nice and very deep work of Bjordan about the regenerative potential of the dental pool, justifying what, happening, what is happening when we leave dentin that doesn't appear as good as we thought that it should appear. And the resume is that whenever we seal it perfectly and we decided to, to remove the more infected surface, the result is much more less endodontic treatment. What for our patient is longer in the long run for the life of their tooth. So what, do we, what should we do? We have to remove caries completely from the peripheral area in the dentin, and then we have to be able to remove uh, very carefully the caries adjacent to the pulp and always avoid the pulp exposure. Here we have an example. Here we treat a young patient with a more or less deep cavity as you can see, we have two different uh, materials close to the pulp. What we use was glass ionomer. And over it, at the end of the treatment, treatment, we will have some composite to replace the enamel. There's some publication now about if it's a big difference or not between calcium hydroxide and glass ionomer in these kind of situations. And the answer is that almost the response from the cells is the same. So many times is the, is the material that we should use in, in, with the aim of avoiding reopening the cavity. So we are going to do a stepwise, but we, we are trying not to reopen, just to see what is happening or to remove the calcium hydroxide because we most of the time are using glass ionomer glass ionomer like Echia. As you can see in this video, we are going to open, uh, we are going to remove the enamel. As you can see, the, ca the caries is very, very deep. And uh, because of the possibility 
of accidental exposure, we are going to use um, rubber dam. And most of the time, even if we use glass ionomer, we use it because it's better for controlling the patient. And if the patient is young, it's going to be a cleaner restoration, in our opinion. So we remove the enamel with a diamond burn, and then we remove the more infected dentin. Remember that we are going to be very wise removing dentin because we don't want to be close to the pulp. We want to restore and let it really compensate, let the tooth to compensate this aggression from bacteria because we now know that the pulp has a very, very high capacity of response. So we do this selective carriage removal and then we will fill the cavity with a very aesthetic material, even if it's a glass ionomer, and we will cover it with the coat because once it is, the echia is covered, it's going to be mechanically and aesthetically uh, better. So we have a restoration that we don't need to change in a, in a short period. We can leave it enough time to see the, the progression of the root development or the formation of this dentin, reactive dentin, which is the result of the pulp response. And after that, we have something very, very important that we talked at the beginning. Uh, remember that we said that we have to identify, we have to prevent or uh, to do an early treatment of the causes of the disease, then we are restoring, always thinking on maintaining vitality as much as possible. We have to think that the pulp is a very, very strong tissue, stronger than we thought before. And once we have done that, we have to maintain the patient. We have to gain the compliance. We have to be able to motivate the patient because as we know in periodontics, we need to see the patient frequently. It's the better way to maintain their motivation. They have to come to the clinic. They have to see what is the, the, their work working, if it's enough or not. They need our reinforcement because at the end we are going to talk with them, uh, congratulate them for the, for the advances in the, in, in the situation, in, the, in their oral health. And then we are going to try to maintain these healthy tissues, the healthy oral environment in the long run. And for that, we are going to, the, to, to repeat the test. We need to see, and they need to see the results. So we always do a first visit. Sorry. We always do a first visit at one or two weeks after the first control. Sorry. We always do a first visit, a compliant visit, one or two weeks after the first test. We check what, we are, what they are doing. We check if they understand very well our instruction and we reinforce the instructions about oral hygiene. Then we check again after six weeks, we took pictures, we do some tests, the basic ones, and of course we talk about again plaque detection and oral hygiene. And after that, every three months, we try to see the patient if it's a high risk patient. So after three months, we are going to do all the tests again, because we know that we have to be the, able to see the evolution. So we'll do the test at the first year, during the first year, at least four times. At the beginning and every three months, because we have to help the patient to maintain uh, this controlled environment to avoid new lesions. We have here a clinical case. It's a very young patient. In the young patient, it's very difficult to control the motivation and the maintenance. Here you see how acidic is the plaque. We started in April uh, because there was a lot of lesions we decontaminate. So we seal the lesions with glass ionomer. We work in this way that we talk about uh, 
hygiene, instruction, motivation, remanialization. And after one year, what we have is that we have better situation in the terms of, of aesthetic, of, of course, in the terms of healthy tissues, uh, meaning that there's no inflammation, the control of plaque is very good, and of course the patient now is working with us together to maintain that in the long run. So thank you very much. I think we have ended here. What we recommend is please be a biodentist. We all can do that. It's for the well-being of our patient. And if you have any question, uh, here we are and we can answer whatever you want to. Thank you very much.